Beatitudes. And this morning, our scripture comes from Matthew 5, 13 through 20. I know that these verses will sound familiar to, to you because you've heard them many times. But no matter how many times you hear them, there's still that excitement of knowing that God has said, we are the light. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they, do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I do not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till it is all fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And that is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Jesus always used examples that were common to people, things that they understood on a daily basis. When we think about salt, there are many aspects that Jesus' audience would have immediately recognized and known. Salt was considered pure. Salt was a sign of purity. And also, a salt, salt is used for preservation. How many of you have salted hams and hung them in a the smokehouse? Aren't they good? <coughs> and so we know that as Christians, we are to be pure. Now, we live in a world, and the Bible tells us not to be of the world, but to be of the Lord. What that means is we are to be pure in our thoughts, and we are to be pure in our actions. That is not always what happens in the world. But we as Christians are to be pure in the fact that we are to seek the right way. Have you ever been in a company at work or at a ball game and people are saying things that you know are unkind? Or they're saying things that are very negative toward a, another group of, of folks? Or maybe someone is putting down their spouse in a very negative way. We as Christians need to be the ones that say, we need to defend that. We need to say something. We need to stand up. Now, my husband has taught me over the years that sometimes it is best not to say everything you want to say. I remember going to the Y with my boys and we'd go swimming in the summer in Mount Erie. And we loved it. Except, in the summertime, there were a lot of African-American children. That didn't bother me in the least. What did bother me was the words that came out of their mouth. And so, what do you think I did? I told them. I said, that is not appropriate conversation for you to have in public. Or I would say, that is not the proper way for us to talk. You're not expressing anything other than vulgar words. My two sons told me they were not going back to the pool with me anymore. That if I kept that up, we weren't going to have a car to ride home in. <laughs> but we're the adults. We're the ones that are supposed to say, this is the way it should be. And so Michael, the eldest son, said, Mama, why don't you just carry on the conversation with me and Matthew, and we'll talk about things, but our speech will be different. And then that will set a better example than you condemning what they're saying. 
So in other words, sometimes it's not so much what we say, but what we do. I like to tell this story because sometimes I find thought with Ted now that he's older. And so I worked with this young lady, we worked at a, a school, and, and uh, we were both special ed teachers, and sometimes we talked, and oh my gosh, she talked about her husband like he was off. I mean, horrible though, I mean, it was bad. And so I kept wanting to say, well, how do you expect your marriage to grow and be better if all you do is put him down? And if you put him down to me, who else do you put him down to? It's kind of like in a marriage, like shooting yourself in the foot. And so, one day she said to me, you don't ever say anything negative about your husband. And I thought, thought, and thought, what do I say? And so finally I said, well, you know, there's nothing to say. I don't have anything negative to say. I have nothing to say. I've become a little more critical now, but that's okay, I'm, I'm learning. But when she found out that I was not a minister at that time, but Ted was, and the first thing she found out about me was that I was a pastor's wife. And you know, that's a special role, a role that I never took for granted or did not appreciate. And so one of the first things she said to me is, you're a preacher's wife. I didn't know if I was to confirm or deny, but I said, yes, I am. And she said, well, I hope you're not gonna talk about religion all the time. And you know how the Lord just gives you something to say and you're just so thrilled because you know it didn't come from your mind. And I said, I promise you that I will not talk about my faith. It is very meaningful to me, and it helps me each and every day. But until you ask me, I will not share the joy of living a Christian life. No, she never asked me. That was okay. I was ready when she did. Or I would have been ready when she did. Preservatives. You know, sometimes we all fall short of being that which the Lord has called us to be. And I would like to tell you that that is not true of me, but it is. You know me well enough to know it is. But salt is a preservative. You can preserve meat. You can preserve other things, fish. Now, we have to remember that in Palestine, not only was there no electric lights, there was no electric refrigeration. And I dare say that the river... Um, Jordan did not get cool enough in the hot summer in the desert to cool anything off. And so all the way, only way they had to preserve food was salt. So salt was a savior. And so we are to be the salt of the earth. And Jesus said that he didn't say we could be, we might be, or we want to be. We are. We are the salt of the earth. Have you ever heard somebody say that someone is the salt of the earth? I mentioned my great aunt and uncle often because they were very important in my childhood. My grandparents lived further away than, than aunt Kent and uncle Harry because you see aunt Kent and uncle Harry lived across the creek from us, that's what you see. And uh, I, that land had been in our family for 200 years. And so uncle Howard and aunt Kent, they owned the part of the farm that belonged to their grandfather and my daddy and my mama, they owned the land that belonged to my daddy's grandfather, who they were brothers. And so that's how we all lived on that little, that little 200 acres together. But I'm telling you this, not to impress you, but I'm telling you this because if you've lived beside of somebody for all your life, there's not too much they're hiding. And I know that sometimes it's hard to pray for our neighbors when they're doing things that make us uneasy or they're doing things that, you know, scare us. And, you know, when our house in Mount Airy, the house on the side of it, sold, uh, we were a little concerned because who was going to buy this house beside of us? And we have a shared driveway, and we live on Main Street, and the moral of that story is don't buy a house with a shared driveway because you, you only got half of one. But we, we get along, and, and we work together, and they're very nice to us, and we're nice to them when we're there. But... Your neighbors don't always do things that you think are okay or that you know are not okay. You can take a stand, you can pray for them, and you can let the Lord use you to show your light. Salt lends flavor to things. I want to go back to Uncle Howard for just a minute. Uncle Howard was my great uncle, and he was a farmer. And he wasn't just a farmer, he was the best farmer I knew. 
And when I was a little girl, my sister and I, uh, we just loved to go to their house. And Aunt Ten had homemade chocolate chip cookies every time we went to her house. Not after I left, but when I got there, she had them. Aunt Ten was one of the most amazing women. She didn't go very far in school. She hadn't traveled many places. I think she got to go to the Raleigh State Fair and she got to go to Knoxville, Tennessee because one of her sons lived there. But by worldly standards, no one would have counted her among the elite. Uncle Howard had to quit school in the second grade to help his family farm. He lived on another farm when he was growing up. And you know, that doesn't happen anymore, but at that time, that wasn't unusual. Uncle Howard was the smartest man I ever knew. He loved the Lord more than anybody I've ever known. And if you ever heard Uncle Howard pray, you knew that you were standing in the presence of greatness. Aunt Tent died when she was 96, and Uncle Howard died when he was 98. And we all look to Uncle Howard as a, a person who discerned the word of truth. When I told my mother that God had called me into the, the pulpit ministry, she immediately went to see Uncle Howard. She asked Uncle Howard what he thought. And the salt of the earth said, if God has called her, she must be obedient to the call. And then my mother was obedient. Uncle Howard was truly the salt of the earth. He influenced our family in so many different ways. There were three girls, and then my brother was born. Uh, he's 15 years younger than me. But we all said we want to marry somebody like Uncle Howard. There was just one problem. There was only one Uncle Howard. But Ted came pretty close. Uncle Howard was an outstanding businessman. He was a leader in the church. By common standards, he should not have been a leader. Like I said, he had a second grade education. He grew up on a farm in Surrey County. But boy, he could raise a crop. But I think the most important thing Uncle Howard did was he helped raise three great nieces, my sister. One time when I was in seminary, Uncle Howard had, had grown ill, and we knew that it, it wasn't going to be long. And in seminary, you learn about what a lot of important people said. Theologians, they're called. I can name several of them. Augustine, um, John Wesley's considered a theologian. St. Paul is considered a theologian. Karl Barth is considered a theologian. And so at that time, we were reading about Karl Barth in one of my theology classes. And I said to my roommate, Uncle Howard is smarter than any theologian that I've ever read about. And she said, I don't think you're correct. And I said, Uncle Howard lived the life Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He was a great theologian. Isaiah told the Jews that they were to be God's light and that they were to um, be a light unto the Gentiles. And sometimes when we read the Bible, and I know I sometimes am surprised when I find out that it was already said in the Old Testament that many things that Jesus said went to the Old Testament. But Isaiah said, you are to be the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then he said, we are the light of the world. And so we take this authority with us as we go out into the world. Have you ever been in complete darkness? <coughs> I don't know about y'all, but as I get older, my sight is not what it once was, and especially at night. 
And so I was driving uh, from some location back to East Bend where the parsonage was. And, and to get to the parsonage, you had to drive on this real curvy road. And if you've never been to Gadkin County, there are no street lights. None. Zip. Zero. So here I was, and it was foggy, and, and I was going down the road, and I knew that I was to turn to the left on Donahoff Road, and then that would lead me where I had to go. I think I passed that left turn about four times before I ever could get it. And it was wooded, so you know, if I turned the wrong way, where was I gonna be? And when I get anxious, I like to listen to uh, gospel songs on my CD. I kept putting my CDs in and they kept rejecting them. And I knew they were good and I put them in and rejected them. My son later told me I had them upside down. And they don't work when they're upside down. And if I'd have known that, I'd have turned them over. But at the time, I felt like I was in total darkness. And the best way I can describe Donahoe Road is, um, is there a Pea Ridge Road? So, I was so thankful when I finally made the right left turn. And when I got to the end of the road, I knew where my driveway was. And I was so relieved. But you know, that's been a long time ago, but I have never forgotten how alone it was in complete darkness. It reminded me of a time before I invited Jesus to live in my heart. It reminded me of a time when I was blind. It reminded me of a time when I did not know the Savior. Don't you like that song? Hank Williams sang it. I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but now I see. And that's what being a Christian is like, seeing the light of the world, not only in the Lord, but in your own life. You know, I like to talk to people. And so if I'm at the grocery store, and if I'm at the Dollar General store, if I'm at the nail salon, I'm talking to somebody. And what I find out is as you talk to somebody, you can tell very quickly if they know the Lord. Because if they know the Lord, they have joy in their heart. And if they are gloom and doom, then you know there's no light in their heart. Now, I'm not saying that we have to knock people down and tell them about Jesus. But we need to let our light shine anywhere that we can. When you're in the line at the grocery store, tell the clerk, thank you for her help. Or sometimes at the Dollar General store, I can't find something. And so they help me and then I say, oh, you just don't know how good that made me feel. Because I've been wandering all over the store and I couldn't find it. And you show me where it's at. And their face lights up because you've appreciated them. So if you're in the lunch line at school, thank the lunch ladies. They're the best. If you're talking to the phone company, try to remember you're a Christian. If your cable goes out, when you call them, remember you're a Christian. When you're on the ball field, remember you're a Christian. Now, that doesn't mean if you're playing sports that you give up. It just means that your actions resemble the light of the world. In the 17th through the 20th verse, Jesus says, I came to fulfill the law. Now, you know, Jesus wasn't really uh, very favorable to Sadducees and Pharisees and Levites. We all know that. And any time they had an occasion to harass him, or an occasion to um, crucify him, or if they had an occasion to try to prove that he was a false person, they took it. But we know that each and every time our Lord and Savior responded through the power of the Holy Spirit. But in these verses, it says that he did not come to destroy one part of the law. He came to fulfill it. And I think the thing for us that makes it difficult is how he responded to those folks and then how he says that he came to fulfill everything. The Jewish folks 
wanted to be sure that they kept the law. And so they had scribes and they had um, Sadducees and Pharisees and their job was to interpret the law. And so, for example, if the law said that you were to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, then they wrote about 400 volumes on how to not do a sin against that commandment. If you led your donkey out of town, that was not keeping the Sabbath holy. If you cooked a meal on Sunday or on the Sabbath for him on Saturday, then you had broken that commandment. If you put a pack on the back of your mule, that would work on the Sabbath, and you would break the Sabbath. Jesus isn't talking about the man-made rules here, in my opinion. He's talking about the commandments, because that's what he says. I came to fulfill the commandments. You know the commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the commandments. The Ten Commandments. The commandments when it says, Thou shalt do. Those are the commandments, I think, that Jesus is referring to here. For he did not come to fulfill tedious, man-made rules. He came as the Son of God to fulfill his responsibility as the Savior of the world. And so, at Providence United Methodist Church, we are going to take our light out into the community. When you help with the food truck, you've taken your light out into the community. When you go to school and you don't bully anybody, you've taken your light into the world. When you go to the grocery store and you see someone struggling to get out the door with their groceries and you say, oh, I can help you, and you do, you are the light of the world. You see, we don't have a choice. As Jesus said, we are the light of the world. And each day, each week, I read things that have been written about different Methodist ministers that I know, some I love, some I don't know. And you know, they're all saying the same thing. God is not finished with us yet. And another thing they're saying that I truly believe is this. There's going to be a great revival. There's going to be a revival. There's going to be one. And we're going to be ready. And we're going to have our lights shining so that others can see Jesus Christ in our lives. And they're going to think, what makes them different? What makes them different? Have you ever talked to anybody that you didn't know and it didn't take you but about two seconds to know that they knew the Lord? They didn't tell you. It was you. The Holy Spirit just let you know. So folks, let's go out into our community and let's let our light so shine that others can see Jesus in us. I want to say one more thing about salt. It talks about that if salt loses its flavor, it'll be thrown out on the, on the road and people will walk on it. Have you ever went to the grocery store and tried to find food that had no salt in it? Have you ever tried to eat food without any salt in it? I don't care what they say about Miss Dash, she just ain't the same. So, salt adds flavor to our lives. Salt adds flavor to our food, and Jesus Christ adds flavor to our lives. We're not supposed to be gloom and doom. We're supposed to be the joy of the world, because we got Jesus. We're supposed to add flavor wherever we go. But Jesus talks about when the salt has lost its flavor, it is, it is uh, put underfoot. In those days, in biblical times, if the salt lost its flavor, it will, be, um, it will be put out on the road and then it's used as a walkway or as a path. How can salt lose its flavor? When you mix it with other things. When you mix it with other ingredients to the point that the salt loses its flavor. Your salt in your Norton pan is not going to go bad. 
But if you mix it with something else, this can happen. I went to a restaurant one time and I ordered green beans. I love green beans. If you grew up on a farm, you love green beans too. And so I ordered green beans. I never tasted worse green beans except the ones I picked sometimes. Someone had put sugar in the green beans. Sugar. And I kept thinking, is this right? What's wrong with this? So when I went to pay, when I went to check out, I said, uh, y'all need to tell people if your green beans have got sugar in them because some of us are not supposed to have that. And she said, oh, no, no, no. It had salt in it. It was not sugar. I knew it was sugar. I had tasted sugar, and I had tasted salt, and I knew that was sugar. So finally, I didn't argue, but she said, well, maybe they put sugar in it instead of salt. And I thought, I believe they do. Don't mix your salt. Keep it pure. Keep it the preservative that it is. Let it flavor your life in such a way that there is joy in your heart. Our closing hymn.